Hi, I'm Bob Watchorn. Uh, I'll be presenting a webinar on South America tonight. I've uh, been a uh, mine geologist and an exploration geologist for about 50 years. And after that, about 10 years ago when I retired, I've been doing research. And I'll be talking about uh, research I've done on South America just over the last six weeks. I knew virtually nothing about South America and now I only know a little bit more. However, what the little bit more that I do know is more than any other geologist on Earth has actually seen so far. So hopefully it'll be a very interesting talk. And the idea is to stimulate discussion and uh, uh, ideas in order to um, progress our exploration expertise based on uh, real, geolog real geology as opposed to um, objects in 3D that is currently what's shown the, under the Earth's surface. Now on to South America. We'll be using uh, geology, Landsat, topography, magnetics, gravity and seismic tomography to look at South America um, pretty much in that order. We'll explore down to the core mantle boundary, 2,900 kilometres. We'll see uh, fairly clear evidence of how the Earth and the South American continent uh, formed by uh, lunar mare type impact craters um, in the late heavy bombardment. We'll look at the dynamics of the formation of Earth and plate tectonics. Uh, and. Uh, I think you'll be very surprised that, uh, well, I'd be very surprised if plate tectonics can actually work uh, at all, really, after what you see today, as we currently see it. We'll look at new mineralisation concepts and uh, just as a bit of a hook for uh, people, it'll, the emphasis will be on diamond targeting for all those ladies that are listening. Uh, so I've written uh, lots of papers on these areas, on Australia, um, Finland, China, America, and, and the last webinar was on Africa. And the area that I'm actually going to be looking at today is the greater uh, South American uh, continent, I guess you would call it about double the size of what, uh, what's normally recognised as South America above water. The actual, uh, lot, I've got a lot of papers on my website, Geotrex, uh, well worth a look for up-to-date research ideas. So the geology of South America, um, effectively South America is would be well over half of South America would be Archean or Proterozoic, underlain by these uh, cratons here. The mines really don't form uh, patterns like we saw in Africa, except that there is a, uh, they form along a line there and a, a line there, so orthogonal lines. So more um, linear, uh, linear uh, guided rather than ring guided at the surface. So Brazil was the world's largest diamond produced from the 1700s to the 1900s. So the aim is to uh, see how we can discover new fields in Brazil of diamonds, where they might lie. Uh, obviously they haven't uh, found any for a long time, so it could be uh, a good time to get a few new ideas. Um, now, when I'm doing these sort of studies, I always try and base it on reality, um, and so it's all right producing all these wonderful rings and linears and things. So I've picked a couple of impacts uh, today. One of them's the Ar Ariguana impact, which was the Permian one that wiped out 95% of the life in about 260, 250 million years ago. Um, so we'll be seeing if we can find that one. And uh, the actual, um, I was wondering, perhaps uh, Araguana is um, 
So the diamonds mainly occur from 100 to 250 million years. That coincides with uh, when that impact happened. And they do seem to be lying either side on the structure of the uh, just hypothetical. So this is um, Landsat with the mining fields. Um, can we see Araguana um, on this particular plan? Well, you can see Araguana on that plan. So it actually uh, sits there. Uh, that's actually what it looks like on the plan. That's the width, the 40 kilometre width of the structure. And that's the uh, ring around it, which is about 400 kilometres in diameter. There's another ring around that, about a thousand k in diameter. So these uh, minor little structures have had a huge impact underneath. As people know with Araguana, because uh, it uh, actually fell onto an oil shale field and uh, probably blew the whole countryside up and that's probably why it caused such devastation. So this um, plan, this uh, enhancement of Landsat is actually to uh, show ring structures, little, little ring structures, bigger ring structures, um, and, uh, one coming down around that way, and then show them on the main, main plan here. So these are um, 5,000 kilometres in diameter. They're not, uh, not little, little beasts here. This is the first lot of really major rings that uh, I've seen on this side of the Atlantic. I saw exactly the same thing in Africa. In fact, the other half of this one's probably in Africa. So you're actually the first people that have seen uh, these, this size rings, pretty indisputable evidence of them. Now targeting for diamonds, uh, so uh, probably many different ways of targeting for diamonds. Most people target diamonds by looking, there's a mine, they'll look there and they'll look here and they'll look there. What I'm saying is you've got to look, uh, look in the areas where the diamonds are, see where they sit and then follow those areas along. Look for kimberlite pipes. So these, this is a, a worms diagram uh, for those geologists that know what worms are. Uh, effectively the uh, really abrupt changes in the uh, Landsat um, characters. So the diamonds actually, as in Africa, they sit on the uh, light coloured areas and generally speaking the metal mines sit on the dark coloured areas. In fact the metal mines sit on the dark coloured areas even when they're in amongst the white, the white lines. Uh, nickel mines sit right next to the diamond mines so the um, so diamond mines a couple of hundred million years old, the nickel mines a couple of thousand million years old suggests that these particular areas are very long lasting uh, fluid pathways. It's a topography. Uh, it's, uh, once again, so the uh, light coloured lines, uh, the little dashed lines here are actually uh, the landsat we've just seen. And the uh, yellow, big yellow lines are the new rings that you can see in the topography. There, um, there's good correlation between those two, particularly with the wall, the big rings. Araguana in, uh, doesn't show up at all in the topography. Um, and yet there's a lot of uh, other rings in the topography that show up well, um, sort of four or 500 kilometres in diameter suggesting that uh, big as Araguana might be uh, in its uh, final limit, it wasn't a very pervasive impact as opposed to these really big ones. And it happened right on the surface, so one would expect that you would see it in the topography. Uh, this is the magnetics, uh, the big uh, west-facing concentric structure, about 8,000 kilometres in diameter, goes right uh, around there three rings of that and the uh, centre of that one lies out in the Pacific. And then there's a northeast facing structure which is about uh, 6,000 kilometres in diameter and the uh, centre of that one sits in uh, French Guiana 
very mineralised area. So you can see on the plan over here the representation of the big and small rings that are there. Uh, the mag magnetics are up close with the mines on it. You can see that the uh, mines are on the most abrupt magnetic signatures. In other words, uh, the areas where you've got lots of intrusions, uh, lots of faults, a lot of change in the magnetics. Diamond mines uh, sit on the edges of uh, multiple rings and within a ring itself there, this, this lot down here are the same. And the mine, the diamond mines uh, sit right on the intersection between these two really large rings, which is probably what you'd expect because they're very deep. Um, uh, they come from six, seven hundred kilometres below the earth. So not influenced by anything that's sitting right up here. The gravity, uh, one thing I noticed about the gravity was that the, the mines so you've got rings, not as well defined as, as in other places, but you've got rings uh, and the mines sit on the north side and, and the around on the east side and the intersection between rings. Uh, now in Australia, the West Australian mines sit on the east side of the rings and that's the tectonically active side of the ring. So the ring is actually uh, a large solid area and that's getting pushed along and it's uh, the active side would be the bow of a ship. That's where all the mines sit. It indicates the direction the continent was travelling. So Australia travelled east during its whole formation. Uh, has South America travelled and accreted to the northeast? Didn't get a chance to look at that but I'm sure those that know about South America would uh, put me right on that one. So the gravity, I did a little um, worm study again and exactly like the um, Landsat and the uh, uh, whatever it was that I showed you a minute ago, um, the diamond mines sit on the white worm lines and the metal mines sit close by but they're off them. And this is a targeting exercise on the uh, worm lines on gravity. Uh, this is, uh, they show a completely different direction to explore if you're using gravity than if you're using Landsat. Um, I see this as a plus because er everywhere where those two cross, that's, uh, that's double, the, double where you would actually look. So this is giving a big area to look for diamonds. Remembering the scale here is uh, 200 kilometres. So we're looking at an uh, area the size of Western Australia here. Uh, now we get into the seismic tomography research, which is, uh, to me, very interesting, because this is all new stuff. Um, geophysicists can give you a lot better definition of seismic tomography, so I won't even bother to try and explain it, um, except that it's a bit like an MRI scan and you're able to uh, um, cross-correlate the different structures and they end up with a, a detailed structure in MRI. Currently, uh, the geoscience industry, they can't get this resolution. They can only get 100 kilometres of uh, resolution as of a couple of years ago. And uh, I can get down to about five to 10 kilometres resolution. An unimaginable difference that it makes to the, uh, being able to look under the world uh, data I've actually used is uh, in plan is uh, sort of roughly 30, 40, 70 kilometres down and 170 and 200 kilometres. Uh, no one in their right mind would say that these are fantastic uh, databases or images to work from, but you actually can get uh, very good results using it. This is an example of the first of these results uh, by comparison. That's, that's what I started with and that's what I finished up with. So the dark brown colours, they're um, wet rocks. Generally out in here, they've uh, come down from above. They're um, depositional. Uh, and these ones here have come up from beneath, they're the Andes. Um, one thing that there's some big rings there. The mines do lie around and in the rings, but one thing that do notice is that the mines lie in the Wet rocks, uh, the slower uh, rocks to tomography, uh, very few actually lie in the uh, whiter rocks. 
So, and that's, that's one, uh, so right around the edges you get these mines. That's, the, uh, that's one thing that the current industry does uh, use as a targeting tool. Um, now, if you want to go into 100 times more detail, uh, this has uh, been enhanced uh, a heap more. So exactly the same starting image. And uh, in this image, you can see um, long linear structures. Uh, it would be called the Boulder Lefroy Shear Zone, I guess, except that it's about 5,000 kilometres long and about uh, two or 300 kilometres wide. Another one down here. Another one running right from, uh, in fact, uh, right across the um, Mid-Atlantic Ridge from the top of, top of uh, Africa right down to Antarctica. Um, another one there, the same. And where these, these huge big linear structures intersect, that's exactly where the diamond mines are. Um, however, as I was looking at this, the um, thing that struck my eye was this uh, funny looking little ring up here and then I noticed there was other rings sort of popping out of the uh, woodwork around it. So I scratched my head and said, well, oh, that's actually very close to where uh, Chicxulub, the impact that uh, cleaned up all the dinosaurs about uh, 66 million years ago would occur if it was there. Now people um, so that, that's about uh, 500 kilometres across, that little bit in the middle there. Um, Chicxulub itself is about um, 180 kilometres in diameter. So most people believe that it didn't have much impact further out. Um, this shows that it certainly did. Uh, so I, I check, if it is Chicxulub, I checked it up on the uh, Google Earth and uh, sure enough it, li it lay exactly where Chicxulub was. So I thought, oh, we'll have a bit of a closer look at this. And so we uh, went in and had a look at the uh, centre. And the centre was uh, a bowl-shaped structure which is identical to what you see in the gravity 3D image down here. That's, uh, that's my one of Chicxulub. Mine's got a funny looking uh, 10 o'clock hand sticking out of it, as has the gravity one which is the recognised one. It's got two or three rings in it and is about the right diameter, 150k, which is uh, shown here. In my uh, looking at the seismic of that about uh, seven or eight years ago, I noticed that the, the rims of the um, impact, they just plunge straight off down into the earth. They'd go down a couple of hundred k. So I thought, oh, well, and so... Effectively, uh, Chicxulub is um, 1,500, 2,000 k across and is the actual reason for the Gulf of uh, Mexico. There have been a lot of argument about as, uh, as Chicxulub's younger than most of the rocks in the Gulf of Mexico, how come um, it's, uh, people say that it formed it? Well, this is indisputable evidence that it did. Uh, that's just a bigger diagram of the uh, t targeting for a diamond using these almighty great big shear structures. Go down to another 20k down, or in fact only 13k down, and you get an entirely different look of the uh, lithology. You had a giant uh, ring structure there. Um, at this depth, the diamonds are actually sitting in little enclaves of... Uh, lighter coloured material in amongst all the very structured uh, crust that sits there. So the crust actually uh, got a lot of different character and morphology as you head down. And now we're looking at the moho. I've never seen a plan, uh, well I've never seen a plan like this of the moho. This is about where the moho sits. And uh, li like you'd expect the actual moho um, is a maybe 10, 20 kilometre thick uh, smooth zone in the seismic and that's exactly what it looks like here. There's not much topography in the seismic, uh, very fine grain, the uh, rings that are there are subdued. However, once again, the mines uh, on that one in particular are sitting right around that ring. 
suggesting that this is the pathway up which the fluids have come. Interestingly, the, the um, morphology or the texture of the uh, moho on the, Afri uh, the South American continent is absolutely exactly the same as what you see in the, out in the Pacific Ocean. However, it's entirely different from what you see in the Atlantic Ocean, which I believe is uh, actually the lithosphere showing at this depth. Uh, go down to 170 kilometres depth. Um, now, this is the first time we actually see giant ring structures. This, this data that's used is just the world tomography, so a really broad set of data, but you can get really fine details. So there's a ring sits there, another ring sits there, that's th these ones here. Um, yeah, I probably don't believe this, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute. But the actual north, north of uh, South America, that big bulge that you see up that joins on to the isthmus to North America, actually lies exactly on that rim of that ring. So these rings originally would have been filled with lava and would have been really, really solid. So the westward uh, travelling South America is uh, pushing into the... Um, Pacific Ocean, but this area here just won't yield uh, because it's so solid. So that, that ring's 4,000 million years old, and so that, that uh, boundary there is probably much the same age. It hasn't moved. So these rings that uh, you probably didn't believe you saw down here, I'll show you the next one. So for those who... Uh, Maybe there are still people out there who still can't see rings. I've had some of the best geophysicists in the world tell me that they don't believe in rings. So if you don't uh, believe in uh, these rings, then you've got your heads in the sand. Uh, they just like a dartboard. And that dartboard is roughly um, 700 to 800 kilometres across. Concentric rings. Uh, absolutely perfect morphology for um, the uh, impacts that you get. Uh, this is exactly the morphology you'll get if that was a giant impact. Once again, the uh, mines are uh, sitting in the uh, structurally complicated areas. But as this, this plan here is really only to, is just an enlargement of that one, it wasn't designed to uh, pick up the fine structures. Now uh, these rings that I've just shown you, they're similar in size and uh, almost exactly the same um, density and uh, uh, filled with lavas as actu actually what the ones on the moon are. And so further confirmation that these things are late heavy bombardment. Um, so these rings here are the ones that we just saw, well we actually saw the uh, that one there was the one that we could really pick out. In fact, it, that one's part of it. There's two or three rings here, and then the major ring sits right around here. But even so, the smaller rings are still exactly the same as what we see on the lunar mares, which uh, we know formed uh, 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. Um, further evidence that the Earth formed in exactly the same way be absolutely totally surprised if it didn't. Uh, we go down to the deepest uh, data I could find on seismic tomography, 200 kilometres depth. I could find stuff right down to 400 kilometres in uh, Africa. Pity I couldn't in South America. Nowhere near as studied as Africa. Uh, so here, um, pretty instructive, right at the full depth that I can get to which is probably only a third of where the diamonds came from. Uh, the diamonds sit around these four, five hundred kilometre diameter rings. Uh, they sit on this uh, about 2,000 kilometre ring. They sit on the lighter coloured inner rings. And there's a ring down here further south, top of um, Argentina, on which... So these would, be, these would be the areas that I'd be exploring for diamonds. Any, anything that looked like that, these type of areas. So further target areas. Uh, this was a little bit of fun. Um, 
last night or the night before I was sitting there saying, how can I get a specific diamond targeting exercise using tomography? And I was flipping through Google images of uh, having put in diamonds, uh, tomography, South America, and up came this plan that uh, showed where the diamonds came from and a lovely coloured plan. I thought, oh, that looks a bit tomographic, and so I ended up um, enhancing that, and uh, sure enough, it is, was a proper tomographic image, and if this, if this is a, uh, if there's a diamond field up here and this was a tomography under it, then you can really plainly see that there's a huge bowl structure sitting down at um, six, seven hundred kilometres down, which is roughly where they say that the uh, deeper diamonds come from. Uh, couldn't get any plainer than that, and then that sort of seems to stop when you get up to the uh, 440 discontinuity, um, suggesting perhaps that the, uh, that's, where, that's roughly where the impact hit. You can see uh, long tubular looking structures coming off the top, which are probably the pipes. The uh, targeting areas I've just put over the top, so you know, you'd plot where that target was and uh, that would be where you'd be exploring. Uh, for those geophysicists amongst you, a uh, piece of pie to um, do 10, 15 kilometre apart uh, set of uh, tomography and orthogonal directions under the diamond fields and then enhance them like that and you would, you would just target the three dimension of that really probably would take you a week to do that. Uh, this is um, the that previous plan that uh, just showing the how I would target on that level, target in the areas that the diamond sits on, and that's more down the str stratigraphy, which actually I don't think is the stratigraphy, and I'll show you in a minute what I actually think it, think these things are. So I went to a fantastic uh, masterclass by Vicky Hansen, uh, must be in 2016 when she wax lyrical on um, Tessera ribbon uh, terrain fabrics at Venus. They were caused by the f lava flows and the uh, all across the surface. I couldn't, all the time I was looking at these in Africa thinking, gee, I'll tell you what, they remind me of something, then I pulled this stuff up. and So that's the Tessera ribbon uh, domains, terrains on Venus. And this is the stuff down at 200 kilometres on Earth they look identical. So these would be lava lakes. There's impacts, impact covered by lava, another impact uh, covered by lava. Um, huge big lava lake there. So I think uh, that's further confirmation that uh, Earth and Venus are very similar in terms of uh, how they formed at this early stage. So look at the Africa, South America tomography. Um, uh, the topography and uh, see what we can see about uh, how all of this information guides us into how we think uh, the African and South American continent have behaved over the last four billion years. Theoretically, according to plate tectonics, that corner of Africa, that corner of South America fitted up into there and over the last 140 million years that's drifted apart to there. Uh, that's a physical impossibility in ter just in terms of how fast it would have had to have gone. But apart from that, uh, how far, how we know that they do fit together, but how close were they? So that's uh, enhanced data for um, rings, uh, showing that they come up, up to the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And... Um, the other thing that this one shows is the diamond fields in South Africa and the diamond fields in South America uh, lie at the same latitude as heaps and heaps of uh, east-west um, structures heading between them and, and uh, they are in Africa in particular they are controlled by east-west structures. They are the same age so that is uh, further confirmation that they uh, did form one supercontinent which nobody doubts anyway. So that's the Landsat. Uh, I'll just pick out rings that match uh, from Landsat to, to the uh, topography plan. So that's Landsat. 
Uh, this is topography, different ring, still matches. Uh, notice on these as we go that uh, this great big west facing ring um, uh, is there on pretty much all of them. Uh, nothing too much matches in the uh, uh, magnetics, perhaps, with, uh, perhaps that one there does. Uh, definitely this one's matching in the gravity with that one again. And the uh, down at uh, the uh, deepest that we've got in the tomography, you can see that the big rings go right out over the, over the um, or under the surface position of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. In fact, right out to where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is uh, at that depth. Um, these are confirmed by uh, a broad uh, look at the tomography at uh, about 250, 200, 250 kilometres. And this, this particular one, you can see that the uh, only cratonic material that's remaining actually still got the um, big ring structures showing in it. And uh, these ones here, they're the same as what we've been seeing all the way down. And that uh, there's uh, remnant cratonic material in all of what is generally the white areas here suggesting the only, only movement that's taken place since 4,000 uh, million years ago, because uh, these, these rings are that old and they're not broken up, so uh, no movement to happen there is only this uh, amount of brown stuff that's here. So instead of being in the last 140 million years, that's probably 4 billion years old, that uh, mid-Atlantic uh, movement. So I've closed up Gondwana, um, taken out the, uh, the middle, the mid-Atlantic ridge, and you see that the rings now overlap a lot, um, well, confirming that uh, South America and Africa were one continent, have been one continent uh, pretty much all the way through and slowly separating. That's the separation. Why I say that they can't have shifted from here to here in um, 140 million years, so even to do 1,500 kilometres in 140 million years, has to do 110 millimetres a year. Current separation rate is only 25 millimetres a year. So even, even that small amount is uh, nearly five times as much um, movement as currently on Earth. And if Plate tectonics, according to my theory, is actually should be speeding up, not uh, slowing down. There's a section across there, right from nearly Fiji, right across to um, the middle of Africa, and that shows that uh, you've got um, the lithology, so that's about 600 kilometres deep. You've got lithology, just continuous lithology, all the way from the west coast of South America right through to the other side of Africa. When we looked at Africa, we could see that that lot went right up into Arabia, uh, suggesting that this, this whole area has been one continent, all, all the, the whole of its existence. So we'll look at the global Earth um, tomography at 200 kilometres in 1850. This was uh, pretty exciting stuff for me because it uh, confirmed a heap of what I've been thinking. So we'll look at the 200 kilometre depth. Uh, once again, not a particularly smart database, better than a lot I've used. Uh, you can get some pretty good um, structure out of it uh, while still retaining the, the uh, tomographic rock types. You can see that um, big ring structure there, uh, maybe a big ring structure there. Apart from that, you can't see too much ring structures. However, when you actually optimise it for rings, uh, enhance it for rings, you can see rings sitting there. And that's surrounded by a bigger ring sitting there. You've got this one, that's South America, that's the west facing arc. Another big ring sitting, there's the centre and the outline is there, that's North America. Uh, little ones around Australia. 
You've got uh, this almighty great big, the strongest one I've ever seen sitting out under the middle of the Pacific. Uh, I'll bet you that's where the um, planet hit Earth that actually formed the moon, uh, as you'll see when I uh, show you the, the core. So we'll keep an eye on that one as we go through. That's the continents. So the big ring that's centred on Africa actually goes up to um, Scandinavia and goes right down to the south of Africa. It's a big one in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I know that, I know that there's a really, really low gravity uh, in there, a really low area. Here's the uh, moon forming, what I'm calling the moon forming impact. This uh, plan was optimised for linear structures and uh, plenty of linear structures there. So you've got, uh, I couldn't help remembering that when I looked at uh, Venus and Mercury in particular, that there's all these orthogonal um, structures running all over the, all over the planet. Figured, well, Earth actually should have them too. However, if Earth has uh, got a mobile uh, mantle, Earth absolutely would not have these uh, structures running from one end of it to the other. It's always been the big argument against big linear structures is that well, how can you have a linear structure over, a, it's like trying to have a linear structure in the middle of a cloud, which I've actually seen. So we'll put the continents on there and that subdivides up. It'd be interesting to track that lot through there. And the, these ones, I absolutely know that that one's real. I've seen it in Africa and um, South America. So off to Venus, Earth's twin. So we'll have a look at the topography there. So these are plateaus, uh, similar to the con continents. They sit about 4K above the surrounding country. This would be equivalent of our ocean um, beds. What happens when you, um, even at that, you can see that there's structures and things there. So, now, if I was a betting man, I would I would say that there'd be a, oops, wrong one. There'd be a a ring there and a, and and a ring here that the, this is sitting around the edge of. Well, there's definitely a ring there. And like Earth, uh, that's the main ring. But if you look right out here, probably 10,000, 15,000 kilometres in diameter. There's another ring sitting around it. I didn't take very long uh, optimising this, uh, but I can see it. If you take the time, you probably would yourself. So that's how I've interpreted it. There's some funny looking big arc structures coming through there, which probably actually are cutting, uh, flat structures cutting through the earth on a shallow angle. So we go down to the earth's core now. Um, now this is interesting in that the uh, thing I noticed about this was uh, lithology going right down to the uh, lithosphere, going right down to the Earth's core and uh, fast cratonic lithosphere going right down to the Earth's core there. We know that the rings sitting on here are actually four billion years old. So that I'm saying that that's actually, that line there is a four billion year old immovable barrier, I call it, between South America and the Pacific Ocean. So we'll see if that can be proved by doing, looking at uh, cross sections, uh, three cross sections through South America and exactly what it looks like. Actual kimberlites uh, shown here, they line up with the, uh, the hottest part of the core down underneath Africa which they say are plumes, but which aren't plumes. So once again, the core uh, actually looks very much like uh, things I've seen of the sun, but uh, you've actually got these almighty great big structures running across here. Most noticeable one is that one, which is that what I call the immovable barrier. There's the uh, big ring there that I think was the moon forming ring impact. It's just uh, the uh, linears. That's the continents put on, uh, supposedly above where they sit on the core. 
a little change of topic. So if you were looking at this um, and you're logging it as a um, slide, a microscopic slide, or you're logging it as a um, wall of a drive underground, uh, you would say definitely that you've got crenulation cleavage all through there, you've got sharp um, structures running there, you've got very late fractures cutting across there and in the opposite direction there. And you've got the uh, sort of original stratigraphy or bedding or something running through in that direction. So this will become a bit clearer why I've brought this up out of context. So this is the southernmost section, 26 south, uh, just south of Rio. Um, the uh, Landsat surface and the tomography down to the core, uh, down through there. Uh, so you enhance that. Uh, when you do enhance it, you get exactly what I got in my Landsat. So you get these big rings sitting all around and you get uh, uh, weird and wonderful shapes down in the tomography down here. Not only that, you get uh, uh, structures that go right across Africa uh, and right down to the core on all different angles. Uh, three or four different sets of them. Now, um, absolutely no evidence whatsoever that this is a, a mobile uh, mantle. It has been mobile in this area at one point, but it's not now, and it hasn't been since these um, big linear structures formed, which I would say were probably around the Proterozoic. All right, so this is how I interpret uh, that, is that, that this line here is the immovable barrier. So the morphology of the rock sitting on the, um, west, uh, the east side is absolutely totally different from the morphology of the rock of the well, subducted. Um, that's, that's the extent of the subducted plate at the moment. And I think this is old stuff that's uh, been subducted. What's well, It's been forced, forced together and then uh, so then all it can do is lift. So you get actually uh, flat tension structures running right through. I believe that that's uh, being uh, under, uh, lifting up has actually provided a pathway up these um, structures through to the mines. So a very strong pathway there and that runs right in line with the Andes. A uh, strong pathway there runs in line with the mines up the middle and this one over here uh, runs in line with the mines up at the Iron uh, Quarter up behind uh, Rio. That's a new deep concept of mineralisation, which I touched on in Africa. Um, so this go north about uh, 1,500 kilometres and exactly the same thing happens. Uh, you've got uh, what looks like relatively contorted lithosphere sitting in here and then um, relatively horizontal lithosphere here a very sharp boundary between the two, which, I, as I said, I believe has been there for four billion years. Uh, this is uh, 3,200 kilometres north of the first section. Um, so, without the lines, there's the bottom of the bottom. There's a bottom contact in the lithosphere there that runs around here. Um, this lot here is relatively horizontal. This lot here is, uh, it's got circles, it's got rings, it's got uh, big curved areas in it. Uh, really looks like a really, really early turbulent flow. If I can imagine it, looks like swirling water. And that's got exactly the same pattern again as you head uh, you up to the north of South America now. And the, the heat that's come up from the uh, from the core has actually stopped on these very large flat structures. So if you're pushing something that way at um, two and a half centimetres a year and that way at four centimetres a year, this whole lot's going to rise. So you're going to get an orthogonal set of flat joints 
which are those ones that you can see there. And the fact that they're open, well not open joints, but they've got a uh, fair bit of character to them means that uh, the heat is stopping on them, just like oil stops on an impermeable barrier. Uh, we've got our section now, the last section goes right round from near Fiji, right around to uh, mid-North Africa. In fact, it goes halfway across Africa and uh, right across to near Fiji. So you've got the core, the hot spot in the cores there, which is there, and that's now the East Pacific rise. Hot spot there is down here, and that's in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is the same thing uh, enhanced with the turbulent flow here. Uh, this hot spot running up there, sinistral movement uh, top to the left and you've got the mid-Atlantic ridge running up there. Notice that the only um, area that's been, only area that's been um, altered really in the mid-Atlantic ridge is only something about 100 k wide. Uh, very late structures you can see here that um, you've got uh, right running right across Africa, you can see them and then they go right down to the core. And they're in a third set of even later structures. Um, the earlier ones of where the mineralisation come down, I could see them quite clearly. They, uh, where you've got your mineralisation, you can see these particular structures running down. All, everywhere I've seen they're all wavy and undulating. Africa had the same thing. Uh, final slide um, that su really summarises, this is uh, section 26 south um, from America, uh, South America across to Africa showing the, the brittle nature of the uh, lithosphere I'm not even going to call anything a mantle because there isn't really a mantle. It's all lithosphere right to the core. I'll be interested to see if somebody can actually prove me wrong on this. First of all, you've got to learn how to enhance stuff like I can. <laughs> and um, there's a challenge for you. So you've got the... Everything's moving this way and then the Pacific's moving this way and this is the contorted zone. And I do remember seeing a geophysical explanation of, an, uh, of this once and they did have a big semicircle there, I think. So takeaways. Um, so we've observed the structural geology from the surface to the core, how it relates to plate tectonics and mineralisation like uh, really early stages at the moment. Um, we can apply ultra detail to get better 3D structural geology of your own areas. Because you've got ultra detail, you can actually get 4D geology. From that, you should be able to develop your own targeting ideas and define your prospective areas. Most importantly, uh, keep your mind open and inquisitive to all the weird side paths that your research leads into and not sort of say, oh, well, that's getting nowhere. Sometimes you only got to do one extra thing. I looked at that 170-kilometre uh, depth ring and said, oh, I don't think people are going to believe that. So I went and uh, spent about another five minutes on it. Now pop this almighty great big 7,000-kilometre ring. So the main thing is uh, clear the humdrum out of your life if you can. Get the cobwebs out, get your hands dirty and get onto the tools and get out exploring. Um, don't be like me and just explore your computer. Get out there and explore on the ground. So I'll see you next uh, webinar in North America. Thank you for your attention.